Episode 11. My conversation with Gary Brackett. Difficult doesn't mean impossible. If you want the best, more important than your goal is your habits and rituals. If it's goal, you're just writing it down on a piece of paper on the board. That's great. A lot of people don't do that. And those habits, you'll realize at the end, were more important than a goal that you set. I'm Paul Estridge, and this is Survive in Advance, a show from the People Forward Network. Let's learn to face life's greatest challenges and move forward together. If you followed professional football in the early 2000s, you probably heard of Gary Brackett, the all-pro linebacker, team captain, and Super Bowl champion for the Indianapolis Colts. What you may not know is the inspiring story behind his on-field achievements. Gary was undersized, undrafted, and unlikely to reach any level of success in the NFL. Yet he didn't let what others saw as disadvantages stop him from realizing his dream. In this episode, you'll hear the story of overcoming adversity and tremendous loss and how it shaped him into the survivor he is today. Sometimes you have to remind yourself of the wins that you had. Um, anytime you're dealing with challenges, obstacles, adversity, you know, you can get down on yourself and think that's your only reality. But life is really about your stories that happen and how we remember them and how we frame them for ourselves and how they impact us. So grew up in New Jersey, um, pretty big family, family of five, had four older brothers. I, I was the uh, youngest boy. I had a sister underneath of me. I probably was the worst athlete in the family. Undersized, middle linebacker, small school, and I didn't get recruited to go to college. So I had to walk on. Um, Rutgers University gave me an opportunity to walk on, and I wanted to play Division One football. I thought I was that caliber player, and I wanted to get my shot. So I got a shot to play, and my parents uh, refinanced the house uh, twice in order to pay for my tuition. So I did my third year at Rutgers, my, my dad called me and let me know that there was no more equity in the house and he couldn't pay. And it's amazing now, because you think that's your parents that you're supposed to do, right? But you're talking about hardworking, middle-class people, and the equity in our home was essentially their retirement, right? I mean, right. that was it. So definitely a, a huge sacrifice. And thankfully, I was being a winner. I was showing up to practice. I had good grades. I worked extremely hard on the football field. I was uh, second on defense, and I was first on special teams. So when the coach heard that I I was leaving – um, I, I went to talk to my, my head coach, um, and he luckily gave me a scholarship. A weird story. I came inside the room. He was just like, hey, I just want to let you know that I'm going to recruit players that are bigger and better than Gary Brackett. I was like, ouch. Like, <laughs> you don't want to kick me when I'm down, dude. Right. Like, I get it. I'm leaving. He was like, nah, man, but you work hard. You show up. So he gave me a scholarship. And this is like the moment that I changed my life. I went inside of the locker room. And I'm high five my guys. They thought they were leaving. And then this one guy comes up to me, Wesley Robinson. Um, we called him Jers. But he came to me and he was like, yo, what's the commotion? I was like, I got a scholarship. I get to stay. And he looked at me without breaking and it just said, like, scholarship? You should worry about starting. And I was like, start? Like, I just had the lowest meal plan possible. Like, I was a kid, like, making friends in the front of the mess hall so I could eat lunch and dinner, right? I mean, you talking about a starting? Like, I mean, hold, hold your horses. But it's crazy to the beginning what I said, the stories that we tell ourselves and the limit beliefs that we have. And my limited belief that I wasn't good enough to be a starter because I wasn't a scholarship athlete, because I didn't go to one of these big universities. And at night, I go home, and I don't sleep, and I'm up all night tossing. I'm just like, all right, well, what, what would I have to do to be the starter? Now, what would it take? And then I started writing down this list. I started getting up earlier. Start watching more film. Um, start eating better, better nutrition, working out harder, get stronger in your legs, get faster. And I wrote down this list, man. It's just like, all right, I, I'm going I'm to renegotiate my deal. Why do you think that stirred you so much, that comment that you ought to worry about starting? Because something – 
clicked in you? What was that? For me, I had this dream when I got to college that was I was going to be a starter, that I was going to make it pro. And then life happens. Then you get beat up, you get beat down, you get told you're not good enough, you get shown you're not good enough, and you, you stop believing in yourself. And you bury that person, that champion inside of you that really believes, like, at your best, you're good enough. And I think that person was asleep for a long time. And then when you heard that, it's like he peaked. He's like, he's, he's not, like, oh, like I'm back in the game? Like, you know, we're going to stop selling for being average? Lit that fire again. Right. And I think once I, once I, I felt that, it just, you know, it set me like, why not me? Why, why can't I be great? Why can't I be the starter? Why can't I be? And it's crazy. I ended up, <clears throat> not only did I start, I was the MVP my last two seasons, and I'm in the Rutgers Hall of Fame. Mm. Yeah, crazy. My goodness. Yeah. And that changed your life, that that comment Yeah, right there by that guy. I mean, there's there's no NFL. There's no, you know, you know I, I'd have been fine, right? I was a business economics major. I was going to go on Wall Street and be a private wealth manager or something. Uh, and I tell people through my culture programs that we're all one decision away. You're one decision away to change your life. And that's up to you, like, how much pain you're in or how much pleasure you want to enter into to, to make that decision. But we're one decision away. And when you commit to that decision, your whole life can change. But you have to commit to it. And building failure into the plan, building setbacks into the plan, Right? It's going to be a roller coaster, but if you stay committed, you, you could accomplish a lot in this life. So then what happened after college? Got picked up by the Colts as a free agent, and then get drafted. And when I got to uh, the Colts in Indianapolis, uh, funny story, uh, I don't think I ever told this before, but I, um, so we're all signing. All the free agents are in like the, uh, the, the mess hall, and we're all signing our contracts. So we had to write in you know, where we're from, height, weight. And then it was like, what team do you play for? It's like the, every rookie has to play for this. So it was like the Indianapolis Colts. I never had to spell Indianapolis before. <laughs> so the guy was helping me out. I was like, how many how many eyes in Indianapolis? Right. And he was just looking like, oh, man, we brought this guy in. Like, he can't spell Indianapolis. What kind of eyes is he going to help us? So I was just like, man, just, just tell me how many eyes is in Indianapolis. But once you understand the formula in, in regards to football, right, because – like opportunities are missed by so many people because it, it's disguised as hard work and requires you to put on overalls. So, so many people, you know, were there for second, third year guys. And they was like, hey, guys, in practice, let's take it easy. I'm like, easy? <laughs> like, easy for you to say. Like, you got, you on the team. Like, I'm not on the team. Like, no, strap up. Like, we're here to work. So I never kind of bought into that, to that brother-in-law mentality. So I got there, man, just, you know, just challenged everybody. And, you know, I got noticed by the coaches, offered the, the opportunity to join the team, 03, uh, play special teams uh, for the next two seasons. And then the third year, I was named the starter. Then I was a starter for my year three, all the way up to year nine when I, yeah, my last game. Was it easy? No. I, it, it's funny. Easy is, it depends on the person's aptitude and the person's skill set. So some parts weren't easy, weren't fun, but other parts were extremely easy and fun. And it was because I decided to master first my position and my roles and responsibilities, and then the people that were in my room, and then the entire defense. So by working inside out, I was able to be a great communicator and understand the challenges at each position. Because some leaders will say, hey, do it this way, which ensures that my job is going to be easier and your job is going to be harder. So for me, I always I got to understand what your challenges were. And, and sometimes I would say, hey, you take the easy role and I take the hard role. And then when you do that, the guy is looking like, excuse me? Like, my coach is telling me this. I get what your coach is saying. Your coach isn't on the field. You take the easy road, and I take the hard road. Because for me, it's just like, 
I'm I'm still like this now. If I'm driving like long trip or something like this or something bad happen, like I want I want to be in control of that. I want to be behind the wheel. I trust me. And because of that, the guys really fought for me and they believed in me as a leader. Like, yo, this isn't the selfish dude who's just out looking like he's he's legit looking out for the team. But initially, my mom told me um, when I told her I was a captain and um, I was a little nervous about being a captain and being a leader. And she told me, she said, the greatest among us will serve. And that kind of was my forte throughout my career and up until that point. Um, we'll get into it, you know, obviously when we talk about the restaurants. I, I learned a little different variation of that. But my mentality then was definitely the greatest among us will serve. So I know the first few years are exciting for you in the NFL, mm -hmm. but you also had some tragedy in your right. life. How did you get through that? My first year, that October, I lost my father. He was a war veteran, and he had a, a, quite a few surgeries, and he was in a lot of pain. And my first year, I get a call that uh, they, that he died. And it, it wasn't surprising. You know, I kind of saw his health diminish. I was like, damn. Like, he used to always be the, the, the person that would call me after the game. Um... So it kind of stung. So I'm processing that, going home. My first year, I did really well financially. I um, you know, was making good money, and then I got like a really big bonus that was almost like as much I made. Mm. So as a kid, you know, I had this very current dream that, hey, I'm, I'm going to make it big time. I'm going to buy my mom my house. So my mom is struggling because she loves her husband. And, you know, I'm like, yo, I'm going to buy you a house. I'm going to make this all feel better, right? Because sometimes when we're letting our ego drive us, we think materialistic things solve everything. Like, let me just buy you something bigger. But that's not – I mean, she was happy about the house, but that's what, what she was missing. She goes in for a routine surgery. She didn't recover. She, she died in the recovery room. She had a stroke. And then my brother at the same time, he was fighting T-cell neuroblastular cancer. So my brother was like my hero. He was like my same size, same weight, uh, same build. He played the same positions. He was like a beast. It meant a lot to you. Yeah. He, got, he had cancer, and I, I did his uh, bone marrow transplant, and unfortunately uh, a year later he passed away as well. So 16 months, uh, my father, my mother, and my brother, um, all while being in the NFL, all while trying to be a star of the team. How did you deal with the loss of – your mother, your father, your brother. I can remember in my parents' home and in their bathroom, um, it was like a picture on the wall. And it wasn't until like after the funeral that I like actually read the picture. And it was the footprints in the sand. And and the footprints in the sand was said like um so this man was looking at his life and he saw you know, the toughest times, he only saw one pair of footprints. Every other time, he saw two pair. So God was with him all the other times. But when it was when it was tough, right? God left him. He forsake him. Like how could this be? So he challenges God. Like God, where were you at in these most the challenging times of my life? And that's what God, my good and faithful son. This is the time that I carried you. So I felt like I was being carried at that moment, right? Because um, definitely my faith um, increased. Um, but oddly enough, so did my gratitude. Because I started really appreciating how precious life was and how not to take it for granted. So now, you know, fast forward, people see me and they're like, man, why do you still got a smile on your face? Like, you getting your butt kicked. I'm like, man, I'm, you, feel, you feel your chest? You feel that beating? I had a chance. And and for me, that's that's all I need. Is there anything special or different about you in your mind, that you could pass on to other people that allowed you to take that perspective on the loss of your family and the stress of trying to make it in the NFL, what is it that allows you to survive all that? I mean, surviving the NFL, that's enough. Right. But you had to do it emotionally within your family. What What is it that allows you to do that? I always try to break things down to the common denominator. And when I looked at the areas that were stressful, 
um, areas that I had no control of and areas where I can make a huge difference, I looked at the common denominator. And those that didn't have me as the common denominator, I just removed myself from. So all the stress, all the worry of what's going to happen, I mean, I can't do anything about those situations. So I really just start focusing on like what can I control? What can I do with, within my powers that's going to make a difference? And it made all the difference in the world because it was like, yo, I can't, I can't worry about that. It, it didn't even happen yet. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. There's enough battles that I'm going to have to face. I, I'm not going to face them before they exist. Did you learn that, or is that just within you? When I was going through it, I mean, I had, I had times especially before my brother passed, where, where I was going to quit football. And at home, my brothers and sisters were struggling. Um, they felt alone. And I felt guilty because I'm in the NFL living this lifestyle, right, cars, money. And, you know, they, they, they're home solo. No parent, nobody to help them guide them. Um, and I think through that process, after my brother did pass away, I just started to realize while a lot of things you can't control and impact, like everyone is not your duty. And I, I would be so tough on myself for how people's lives would turn out. And and the things that I wanted to do for people that are how I envisioned their life to be. And I would put so much pressure on myself for that. And I had to realize, man, everyone is not your assignment. And once you realize that, the, their brokenness is their brokenness. It's, it's, not my, my un, it's not my inability to heal if they're broken. And I had to, I had to, I had to differentiate the two. Because... I don't know why we think this, but sometimes as humans, we think we should we should bet a thousand, <laughs> right? We don't think nothing bad should ever happen to us. All of our relationships should be great. We have no issues with our family. Like we should bet a thousand. There should be no issues, no problems. But MLB three 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 is the magic number. You know, Hall of Fame. And in the business, so many dudes have have lost it all, got it all back. So it's just like I. I, I, my assumption is not that I'm about a thousand. There's going to be tough times. There's going to be adversity. Going to it knowing you're not going to do that. Yeah. But I don't know what it is. But when it gets here, I will figure it out. I've survived 100% of my bad days thus far, and I plan on continuing that. So what happened after that? So uh, um, obviously, solid career, nine years, bunch of fun, um, bunch of accolades on the field, uh, numerous 12-win uh, seasons. Uh, almost went undefeated, uh, won a Super Bowl, which is a huge highlight, uh, lost a Super Bowl. And um, during that time, I, I met my then um, wife, um, had uh, two kids while I was playing. So it was like the American dream, if you will, right? You got the house, the kids. Uh, and if I'm being honest with myself, I probably started to deviate from the game plan. And from the game plan, I'm talking about like God's will for your life. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it was Gary's will. Gary did this. I don't need to come pray and ask you for anything anymore. Like, doing just fine with this big guy. <laughs> right? And you realize what a mistake that is. Because it's those times when you need him more. When did you realize what a mistake that was? Um, my uh, mother, my children, and I, um, she was in medical school and she was in her MBA. And a part of her program, she was doing a Michigan and in a, in, uh, a mission in the DR. And the place we were staying um, didn't have electricity, so they're running off generators, um, the cold water. Um, but we're going to build schools in this mission. And there we're trying to develop a marketing plan for this company that was out there. Initially, she she told me about it. I'm like, that doesn't sound like a vacation. Like, I mean, you and your teammates, you got this. But she was like, hey, like, you want your wife, like, in this, like, I'm like, all right, cool. I, I'll come with you. 
And at, t- at the time, it's just like, look, I'm not participating. I got, we, I got, I drove a car. I got a car. I'm like, there's some CrossFit gyms. There's some sightseeing. There's some stuff I want to do. This is vacation for me. And when I was there, just seeing the environment, it's like, man, just the first day, just, just fill it out. And I went, and we're going up and down the mountains, greeting people. And um, I think the, the uh, Army Corps engineers had just built this. Uh, this dredge that provided water for the community and just the seeing like a pond with nothing but debris and trash. And that's what some people are using that as their water source. And I just saw so many um, people that were deserted from, you know, other islands and stuff and put it and just saw, you would think the attitudes would be a lot worse than they are, but they were so grateful. And it was like, I mean, their houses were, not even as big as this room, with the smiles on her face and a pride that, hey, come look, come look at this, come look at this. <sighs> look at this. Just huts. Huts, concrete floor. Right. Um, bed, no mattress. And you're so proud. It's like, man, why do I got all that stuff back home, man? And I could have, based on what I made, lived a life where I was just, you know, on vacation. But that's probably not who I am. So I had to get involved in something, and 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 for me it was restaurants, and I love what I did, and I served for a number of years. Um, I saw something here recently. Warren Buffett said, um, "More important than how hard you row your boat is what kind of boat you're in." And restaurants, looking at that versus other investment opportunities, and the way that I did it wasn't the best boat, wasn't the best vehicle uh, for me at the time. But at the time, you were excited about it, and you thought that it was a good boat. At the time, it was crushing it. I mean, I had 10 stores. Seven were profitable. I had seven franchisees. I had another 10 in the wings that I was talking to. I mean, so it was working. Um, it was stressful, 400 employees, you know, a lot of things that occur. But I thought it was. But understanding business now, I wouldn't have went all in in that, in that area. What ended up happening? So when COVID came, um, I'm looking at the landscape. And in Indy, January and February are tough mo- months in the hospitality industry. It's cold. People spent all their money in December, so they're recovering. Then March comes, and it's like gangbusters. And so we're preparing ourselves, getting out of tough January, February, heading into March, where it's March Madness, playoffs. A lot of things that happened, and yeah, then they they canceled first March Madness. I thought, ooh, that's gonna hurt. Then they canceled NBA basketball. I'm like, ooh. And then they canceled. People couldn't sit at the bar. Then people couldn't come to the restaurants and eat. So it was just like I, I'm bleeding money. Ten stores, and as an investor. I had assets in places where they weren't liquid. So, like, I'm uh, brick rich and cash poor. So I couldn't continue to have people work and not afford to pay them. So I just made a decision. You know, they're coming out with all the stimulus or coming out with the uh, unemployment type stuff. I was just like, man, I don't see an end in mind. I don't don't see how this is going to get better for us. So I shut the doors uh early so they could get in line and get unemployment and figure that piece out. But two, it's just like, I just, I just didn't see how even we ran the check with the PPP, like we still were losing money. Like if people can't eat inside of restaurants and you're only doing third party delivery door dash, we're going to lose money. And at 10 restaurants in a big way. And our motto as sports bar was, was predicated on people coming in and watching sports. Right. Well, sports were closed. So obviously Shutting the shop down, um, uh, having the file, personal bankruptcy. At the same time, um, I think all the 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 pressures and, and everything else up until that point uh, kind of went to a boiling point with me and my then wife. So we ended up getting a divorce. So a lot of a lot of things changed. Um, um, very humbling, challenging times, man. But going back to the core of being a survivor and knowing I have what it takes. and But now, 
realizing what I actually need to survive. Which is? My kids. Um, uh, peace. Um, just being in areas where there's good energy. Earning a living, but I don't have to swing for the fences. I don't have to be out everywhere, you know, and and say there's networking opportunities. Um, and and taking advantage of the, of of the internet. So your values have changed substantially. What you value today versus what you valued before has changed as a result of this crucible of events that you've had to experience. Mm-hmm. You clearly have a winning mindset. That's amazing. You know, it's innate within you. Right. You carried it with you your entire life. But what allowed you to get back up on your feet? I think my kids just play such, like, through it all, man, the way that they viewed me never changed. The, the way that some of your friends viewed you changed. The way that society viewed you definitely changed. But my kids, I'm still dad, all right? They're still going to pluck me behind my ears. They're still going to, right, um, want me to cook them pancakes in, for breakfast in the morning. They still, So just really, instead of thinking about what I lost and what I didn't have, I just started being grateful for what I did have. And there's no greater, greater legacy for them to see that the external things that occur in your life they, you don't have to look like you what you've been through. And I could have been bitter, angry, it's this, it's that, right, victim blame. But for them to see me, like, nah, I mean, I took a hit, whatever. Like, we'll figure it out. That's so cool. You're a public figure, and you dealt with this on the front page. And I'm not going to say you were proud about it, but you, you were willing to take it on, just like a linebacker, you know? Let's get this thing over with. Let's get going to the next chapter in our life. I think, man, you can handle tough situations with grace. Not only for me, but I always think about the impact, how many other people are dealing with it, right? That's why we have podcasts. That's why we share our voice and our opinions because we know we're not alone. We know and we realize that how unique and how much whatever we went through sucked, there's someone that's probably going through something very similar. And by us sharing our testimonies, by telling people how we overcame it, they too think that they could overcome it. And for me, that's why I'm so vocal about what I've been through and how it affected me and how I changed, because I know someone's going to listen to this. And if, even if it changes one person, I've done my job. What was the lowest time for you through the entire business, bankruptcy, letting everyone know? Yeah, the bankruptcy is kind of is what it is. Um, so this is... Funny, funny now, not kind of funny when I was going through it, but you you get the drill. When you file bankruptcy, you can have ten thousand dollars worth of assets and four hundred dollars worth of cash. So you got to play the game of like, what are you gonna keep? So I'm like, I got got to have my house, got to have a car, yeah, probably my clothes on my back, right? So they came up with a Super Bowl ring. That alone is worth twenty five k. That that alone is worth X. What are you gonna do about your ring? I'm like, all right, well, we get an appraisal. Whatever praise that, I could everything I want above ten thousand. You have to buy back. So I was like, I can. I got friends, right? I could figure out some way to buy this stuff back. So I buy it back. Like, no, it's a Super Bowl ring for the Colts. You were the captain, so we want two to three times what the appraisal is. I'm like, I'm, I'm not. I'm not paying two or three times for this ring. But the trustee's job is to maximize value for the bank. And they thought it'd be best to take it to auction. So I'm like, all right. So I didn't think it was a big deal. They wait until the last week of the season, playoff game, someone ran a story, Gary Brackett is, his rings are going to auction. That was true. That didn't bother me. Another newspaper picked it up and said Gary Brackett is selling his rings. Totally different headline. So I went from my rings are going to auction, which is true, to I'm selling my rings. So now everyone thinks that like I'm on the corner selling things. So I'm getting calls like, what else are you selling? Is the car for sale? Is this a, do you I'm like, so that that was just like, it's like the gift and the curse, right? 
you know, public figure, so sometimes I get nice articles written about me. But you also got to face the scrutiny. And you also got to face the lies. You also got to face the, the deceptions that people do. And it was just upsetting, right? Because I thought, like, what I did in the city and the community, like, I would warrant, like, a better story than that, right? You, you would think that, right? You would. <laughs> but when people are just, you know, CYA and try to figure out, you know, how they can make their own dollar. When you're down, people want to jump on you. Yeah, man. So They really so, do. So that's kind of what it was, yeah. man. And then, you know, I saw the naysayers, and I, I snapshot a lot of people, you know, with their little comments and all their little funny things. And it, it's all funny, but it's a long life, my friends. It sure is. How much did you rely on your faith through all these years? Yeah. Again, the footprints in the, in the sand reference, it was its times where I wanted to carry the load where I actually hit my lowest. It was only when I leaned on the faithfulness and the goodness of the Lord that I really experienced, like, my true joy, fulfillment, and blessings. And if it doesn't happen, I no longer think that I didn't receive it. I now think that I didn't deserve it. It wasn't in my cards. And I didn't know the full story on what that entailed. But the lowest moments were when you... No God. Like, I got this. Like, I don't need to pray. Like, I'm doing pretty good myself. You remember that time? Not for sure. I mean, I can remember the decisions. Like the, I mean, I made a lot of unwise decisions. But this, I say that, and people look at when you file bankruptcy, like, oh my god, he's just a like. I made a lot of, I made a lot of money outside of football too. I, I had a lot of successful companies, businesses, sold houses, had twenty something rental properties. Like at the time, I had to sell and get back. So, I mean, and and, and even in the stories that go down. There's a lot of wisdom inside of that. So that's where people like, it's funny, they count you out. But if you're in San Francisco on the West Coast, you're like the hottest thing on the street. Isn't that the truth? You're you're smarter than you've ever been. Oh. You're more capable than you've ever been. And and the fire is like inside of you is just like orange. And it's just how people look at it. Like, oh, man, like, are you going back into business? <laughs> like, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. What's been the greatest day you've had in the last five years? So I took my kids 2020, first year being separated, and I took them on fall break. And I've always wanted to go see Niagara Falls. So on the way to Niagara Falls, I started, like, planning, like, you know, I don't have anyone to, like, really tell me no anymore. So I'm So in Ohio – off the beaten path, there was like this petting zoo. So we went to this petting zoo first, and it was like, you know, elks and all <laughs> these type of things. So we're going through, feeding them out the window. My my kids are just belly laughing. I mean, laugh as hard as possible. And then we get to uh, Canada. I'm not looking. We're staying at the Marriott. I got Marriott points. So I'm putting it in, and um, I end up at the the, the Canadian border trying to get across to the Marriott that I put in that was in Canada and not in Niagara Falls. So it was on the Canada side. So I get stopped there for like an hour, and my kids are just making jokes. I'm like, hey, guys, this is like serious now. <laughs> this is border patrol. Yeah, yeah, this is like, so we get through that. And then the next day, we go and see Niagara Falls. And I've done and I've been in a lot of cool places. I've never felt something as powerful as Niagara Falls. And since then, I've been traveling a lot, seeing like uh, Grand Canyon and Yosemite Mountains. I saw Mount Rushmore. And I feel like as we get, as we age in life and as we overcome these obstacles and everything, we, we arm ourselves with all this armor. And we call it protection. Like we know better, we do better. But at some point, it starts weighing us down. And it starts actually prohibiting us from living life to its fullest because we're guarded. I'm not going to laugh. I'm not going to love. I'm not going to feel joy because I know what pain feels like. And I protected myself, and I'm never going to feel like that again. But every time for me, and that was the first time I really felt, you ever feel like your heart opened up? And it was like one of those moments. Like I never felt the depth of my heart. Like in a while, 
like as a kid, parent, but I never felt like, and it felt like almost like some of that armor that was like on my heart, it got like broken. And like another piece of my heart had felt the sun or like the power. And for me, it just felt like so alive, so grateful, so thankful. And I, I just remember that moment. And now when I travel now, now I'm, I, I'm outdoors, I do a lot of nature stuff. Like I still see stuff where I get that feeling. And that's why now, like, I I would rather go, like, on a nature hike or a bike ride or, like, anything like that. But, like, I'm chasing that feeling now mm-hmm. of being outside, being alive, seeing something man-made, that creation and that power. So now it's just, like, something that I just, like, almost revel, like, man. And, and it's funny, and you know, just people have midlife crisis. It's really that armor breaking down. They start getting brave. They start wanting to do something. Like, what's going on with you? Why are you acting crazy? No, I'm acting alive. Like, like I was protecting myself for all these years, and I'm finally willing to live free. And I know I might get hurt. But the joy and fulfillment on the other side is worth the potential disappointment. What does it mean to survive in advance? I remember hearing a story about... Um, Tiger Woods, and by him being one of the greatest golfers, but sometimes he would struggle off the tee box. He would hit into some bushes, some woods, or whatever. And most people, like, they'd be out the hole, right? The game's over. But Tiger Woods had this thing where the second shot would be so magical, it would land on the green, and he had put it in. He had saved the hole. It's like, how does that happen? Like, And he had this thing that I would expect the adversity and then expect to overcome it. So I don't know what kind of adversity is out there. I don't know what challenges, what obstacles that I will face in the future. But what I know is that I'll overcome it. The greatest lesson I took from the talk with Gary was how he pulled from the darkest periods of his life faith and gratitude. So seldom do any of us see faith and gratitude when things are at its worst. But his ability to do that allowed him to overcome those dark periods. Gary Brackett is a winner. And the truth is, you're no different. You are a winner. You're alive. You're here today. You've overcome every single obstacle you've faced in life. Through the hardest of times, you've gotten through them. Because you're a winner, you can overcome everything. There's no reason to doubt yourself. Keep this at the forefront of your mind, and you will overcome everything that you face. As you face new challenges, never forget that you are a winner. Thanks for listening to Survive in Advance, a show from the People Forward Network. I'm Paul Estridge, reminding you to keep moving forward and always be grateful. Let's stay connected. Send me an email at surviveinadvance at estridge.net.